Thank you very much. Did you hear what the cow said to the farmer on a cold winter morning? Thanks for the warm hand. <laughs> anyway, it's going to get better, so don't panic on me. I, I start small. Nice to see all of you. How many of you uh, have never seen me before? This is your first time. Oh, wow, most of you, okay. I keep thinking for sure I'm more famous than that, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that is the truth. I'm delighted to be here. Been looking forward to it for a long time. And it's nice to be back. You know, I was here not too long ago. It's nice to be invited back. It says something when you're invited back. It doesn't say everything, but it says something. Maybe it says, let's give him one more chance, right, to see if he can uh, get it right this time. But I'm delighted to have all of you here. We're going to spend the day together. I feel two major responsibilities, and I'm sure you can guess what those are. Number one is to make sure you get your money's worth, right, when you shell out your cash, especially these days. You want to make sure you get full value for the money you spend. And I know the tab for the seminar was not that much. Pretty modest fee to get in. Most of you are your tips for the week, right? So it wasn't that much. But I want you to be able to say when you walk out of here today, it was worth my money. But my biggest responsibility is to make sure you get your time's worth. And the reason I say that is because time is more valuable than money. In fact, you might start your notes with that. Time is more valuable than money. You can get more money, but unfortunately you can't get more time. If somebody asks you to spend your money, that's pretty easy, right? We live in America, we're wealthy, so the money's not the problem. But what if somebody asks you to spend a day, right? You got to think that over carefully. And I know you did. I wouldn't waste one of my days, not for anybody, not for anything. Once I understood how valuable they were, I don't waste any. But uh, to make an investment like today of your money and your time, I appreciate that. Today's going to be costly for me. It's going to cost me one of my days to be here, right? And some money, of course. But, you know, I don't need the money. I take the money, but I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't need the money. But guess what I do need? The time. So I'm here not to just joke with you. I'm here not to just tell some funny stories and give a performance and walk away. I'm here to give you some value, and I want to make it worth your time. Uh, I'm going to invest a day. You're going to invest a day. Let's get the most out of it and see what we can walk away with today. Anyway, for you that have not seen me before, just very briefly, let me just tell you my story. I grew up in Idaho, farm country, southwest corner of Idaho. In fact, my father still lives on the old homestead where I grew up. Uh, he'll be 89 his next birthday. He still hasn't retired. I'm proud of my dad. He's never been ill. He's really something. I'm trying to get him to retire this year, 88. I'm telling my father, what a good year to retire when you're 88. And he says, hey, talk to me in 10 years, right? I might be ready. But anyway, I went to high school. I graduated. I went to college one year. Halfway through my second year of college, I decided I was smart enough, so I quit. One of my major mistakes, I should have stayed in school. Uh, but I thought, heck, you know, I'm smart enough to get a job. That's what life's all about, right? Get a job, pay your bills, work hard, stay out of trouble, keep your fingers crossed, hope for the best. And I figured I was at least prepared to do that. So I quit college and uh, went to work. A little while later, got married, got my little family going, and I'm out there doing what I thought was the best I could. But about age 25, I'm starting to struggle. I've purchased a little more than I can conveniently pay for on time, and the creditors are starting to call saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. What's the deal? And I'm getting embarrassed by that. I'm also embarrassed, big mouth me, with all the fancy promises I made to get married. I'm way behind on those promises, and I'm getting discouraged, wondering what to do. And I thought, well, maybe I should go back to school, right? One year of college, pretty short on an application. But, uh, you know, tough to go back to school, right? Especially when you've got your family going. Time to stay is when you're there. Uh, so I discounted that. I thought, well, if I, you know, had my own business, that would be the way to go. But, you know, I'm short on money. Too much month at the end of the money. If you've ever been there, that's where I was, age 25. 
So I had to discount that, and I'm discouraged, wondering, where do I go from here? And then the miracle happened for me. Good fortune came my way. And who can explain good fortune? I don't know. Remarkable things that happen to you at a particular time. Sometimes it's just unexplainable how those things happen. One of my friends says, well, hey, things don't just happen. Things happen just. Another good note for your notes. Things don't just happen. Things happen just. And maybe that's it. I don't know. I'm an amateur on life. I guess like most of us are, trying to figure it out, how to make it valuable. But I was ready. And my good fortune was, at age 25, I met a very wealthy man. His name was Mr. Schof, Mr. Earl Schof. A friend of mine had gone to work for him, and he started telling me about this man. He said, you've got to meet this man I've gone to work for. He's wealthy, but he's easy to talk to. Uh, and he's got a unique philosophy of life. And the more he kept talking about this man, I thought, well, I've got to meet this man. So sure enough, shortly after that, I had a chance to meet this remarkable wealthy man, and I was impressed. He was wealthy. Sure enough, he was easy to talk to. I was so intrigued within a few minutes, I said to myself, if I could be like him, farm boy from Idaho, if I could be like him, I'd give anything. And then I thought, if I could just get around somebody like him, and if he would teach me what to do, I would be willing to learn. I'm, I'm coachable. And that was my good fortune. A few months later, this wealthy man that I met, Mr. Schof, took a liking to me, hired me, gave me a job, I went to work for him, and I spent the next five years in his employ. And then, unfortunately, he died at the end of that period, at age 49. His last five years, but the first five years of my new life, I got to spend with this remarkable man, and my dream came true. He coached me. He taught me. He taught me the books to read. He taught me the disciplines. He taught me the changes to make in my language and personality. And the things he shared with me during that five years literally changed my life, turned my life around, changed my income, changed my bank account, changed my future, changed everything. I've never been the same since that unique experience. And uh, I wish he was still alive today, Mr. Schof. I'm sure if he was alive today, especially after this seminar, Idaho farm boy makes it to Dallas, Fort Worth, full house, standing room only. Uh, pretty awesome, I'm sure. If he was alive, I'd be calling him today saying, you won't believe what's happening to me. I've had a chance now to share with other people what you shared with me. But anyway, how I got here. Uh, Thirty plus years ago, I was living in Beverly Hills, California. And one day, a friend of mine, businessman friend, said, Jim, uh, would you, I'd like to have you come and share your story with my service club that I belong to, the Rotary Club. He said, I know your story, Idaho farm boy makes it to Beverly Hills. But he said, I think my club members would love to hear your story. He said, if I arranged one of our breakfast meetings, would you come tell your story? Just share a few thoughts. I said, okay. Uh, so I agreed to go give this breakfast talk. And guess what? They liked it. And my telephone rang. I got another call, got another call saying, we heard uh, you've given your story and shared some ideas. Would you come talk to our club? Talk to our club. First thing I know, I'm starting to devote a piece of my business time to giving these talks. And then one day, a businessman who'd heard my talk, I think two or three times, approached me and said, would you come and share that story and some thoughts with my management and salespeople? I said, I got this little company going. And he said, if you'd come tell your story to my organization, he said, I'd be happy to pay you. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be something? So I agreed to go do it, and I got paid. Little did I know, another fortune was waiting for me to translate my ideas into talks and speeches and seminars. Now I've written some books. It's on cassette tape. And now I get to travel around the world. Last year I was in Japan and Israel, Spain, uh, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand, France. Germany, Canada, and now Dallas, Fort Worth. So. <laughs> Idaho farm boy gets to travel around the world and share his story, and here I am today. Anyway, it's almost too much for me to comprehend from where I started, raised in obscurity, uh, in a little small farm community, and now to be here today is pretty awesome for me. 
So anyway, that's just a little bit about my story. My story is probably more intriguing for me than it is for you, but I wanted to hear it again, so I thought I would just, you know, <laughs> bore you with it. Anyway, I don't ask you to be impressed today. I'm the one that's impressed from where I came from to have a chance. But that's the American dream, right? Come true, chance to start from scratch, start from obscurity, start with pennies, start with nothing, and have a chance to transform your life, change your life, set your goals, and see what you can accomplish. So anyway, that's how I got here. And I'm just delighted that this day has arrived and I truly want to make it valuable for you. Let's go to work. Here's what I hope you'll find out of this seminar today for your notes. Here's what I hope you'll find. Number one, sincerity. Above all else today, I hope you'll find me sincere. Best place for people to start to communicate is sincerity on both sides. I'm sure you're sincere or you wouldn't be here today, right? To spend this kind of money, to spend this kind of time, roll up your sleeves today, go to work like I am, and get this message, uh, you've got to be sincere. So I assume you're sincere. Now I want you to see me sincere. But I've got a good note for you to make. Sincerity is not a test of truth. Important note to make. Sincerity is not a test of truth. We must not make the mistake of saying he must be right, he's so sincere. That would be a mistake. And here's why. It's possible to be sincerely wrong. So we don't mistake sincerity for truth, right? Sincerity is only a test of sincerity. Truth has to yet be tested by truth, okay? But hopefully you will find me sincere and truthful. Next. A combination of things I hope you'll find here today. Ideas plus inspiration. Ideas plus inspiration. Ideas, business ideas and social ideas and personal ideas, we all need ideas, right? How to have a good day, ideas. How to have a good year, ideas. How to have your best year ever, ideas. Good health, ideas. Personal relationship, ideas. How to deal with your family, ideas. Sales management, ideas. Financial freedom for the future, ideas, we all need good ideas. So today, I hope you gather up by notes and by what you can remember, a lot of ideas. I want to share as many with you as I possibly can in the time constraints we have. Today is going to go very rapidly. I used to think a day like this was a long day. Found out it's a pretty short day, but I'm going to go as fast as I can, share with you as many ideas as I possibly can. And here's why. Ideas can be life-changing. Ideas can be life-changing, and sometimes all you need is just one more in a series of good ideas. It's like dialing the numbers into the lock, right? You got five or six numbers dialed into the lock. The lock still won't come open, but you don't need five or six more numbers. Maybe you just need one more, and maybe a seminar like this could do it. A sermon could do it. The lyrics from a song could do it. The dialogue from a movie could do it. Conversation with a friend might do it. That one last piece you need, number. Dial it into the lock, that's it. The lock comes open, there's the door for you to walk through. And maybe this seminar today could furnish that for you. One more idea. I know you've come with a lot already. Sometimes we get the impression, I used to have that, that I only had this much going for me and I needed this much. Usually not true. And I'm sure not true of this audience where I find you today, as well dressed as you look today. You know, as fine as you are sitting here today, it isn't that, you know, you've got this much going for you and you need this much. I would assume you've got this much going for you and maybe all you need is just a few more thoughts, ideas, uh, to furnish you some ways and means to turn your life into the dream you want it to be. So, ideas. The seminar is going to be loaded with ideas. I want you to take good notes. But here's what else I hope you'll find here today, and that is inspiration. And who knows the mystery of inspiration, why some people are inspired and some are not. You were inspired to get here, some were not. Who knows the mystery of that? I don't know. How come you made it and the rest of them didn't make it? We don't know what that mystery is. Some people turned it down. Some people said it cost too much. Some people said it's going to take too much time. Some people are too busy, right? A lot of different excuses why some are inspired to take advantage of something that comes to town. Others pass it up. We don't know the mystery to that. Here's what I call it, mysteries of the mind. And I just leave it at that. Some things I don't try to figure out. I take the simple approach now. 
right? Some people do and some people don't. I mean, that's about as profound as my philosophy is. Some buy and some don't buy. Some go for it and some don't. Some change and some don't. And if you've been around for a while, you can usually work out the numbers, right? Out of 10, you know, three do, seven don't. Whatever business you're involved in, pretty soon you got this ratio going. The ones that do, the ones that don't. You say, well, why don't the ones that don't, how come they don't? We don't know. I just leave it as a mystery. I used to try to understand all that. I just take the simple approach now. The guy says, this happens to me, this happens to me, this goes wrong for me, and all this stuff goes wrong for me. How come all this stuff happens to me? I say, I don't know, beats me. <laughs> the best I've been able to figure out is those kind of things always happen to people like you. I mean, right? <laughs> That's the best I got, I don't know. I'm an amateur on this stuff, what do I know? So just take the simple approach, right? That's how it is. Who knows? Interesting story says, the day the Christian church was started. Now I'm an amateur on the Bible, but best account I can remember, the day the Christian church was started, a magnificent sermon was preached. Great presentation. And if you're a student of all, at all, of good communication, it was one of the classic presentations of all times, the sermon, the first day the Christian church was started. And it said this sermon, this presentation was given to a multitude, meaning a lot of people. But it was interesting, as the account gives us the record, it says when the sermon was finished, there was a variety of reaction to the same sermon. Isn't that fascinating? I find it fascinating. It said some that heard this presentation were perplexed. And I read the presentation, sounded pretty straightforward to me. He said, why would somebody be perplexed with a good, sincere, straightforward presentation? Best answer I've got, they are the perplexed. I mean, you know, what other explanation is there? It doesn't matter who's preaching. It said some that heard this presentation mocked and laughed, made fun of the presentation. I thought, hey, this looks pretty sincere to me. If you give a sincere, honest presentation, why would somebody mock and laugh? Easy explanation. They are the mockers and the laughers. What else would you expect them to do? Right. I used to try to straighten all that out, say, well, they shouldn't do that. I don't do that anymore. You know, I've got peace of mind now. I can sleep like a baby, not try to straighten all this stuff out. I used to be so naive. I used to say, well, liars shouldn't lie. See, how naive can you be? Of course, they're supposed to lie. That's why we call them liars. They lie, they lie. <laughs> Well, I don't straighten this stuff out anymore. Anyway, it said some that heard this magnificent presentation didn't know what was going on. And they're usually easy to spot. They're usually saying, what's going on, right? I mean, they don't know what's going on. But interesting, right? A variety of reaction to the same sincere, honest presentation. Now, it also says in wrapping it up, some that heard the presentation believed. And I think that's who the speaker was looking for, the believers interesting now it said the number of believers was about 3,000 so a pretty good first day 3,000 I've had some first days but I never had 3,000 but anyway 3,000 were believers and that's the speaker was looking for the believers out of this multitude and that's about as close as we can come to understanding the mystery some believe and some mock and some laugh and some are perplexed and some don't know what's going on and you just have to leave it that way why because that's the way it's going to be the way to be brilliant is to find out how it's going to be and then say, here's how it should be. I mean, that's how you become brilliant. So anyway, who knows the mystery? I call it mysteries of the mind. We don't understand, but I don't try to change it anymore. On this particular story, as far as we know, they didn't have classes after the presentation to try to deperplex the perplexed. I mean, <laughs> as far as we know, they left them perplexed. They left the mockers mocking. They let the laughers laugh. I mean, they didn't come back and try to straighten all this out. You say, well, how can you build a church? Well, make another presentation. And you'll get some believers and some mockers and some laughers and some who don't know what's going on. So that's about the best we can do. So, but I'm glad I've got the believers here today. You believed enough to shell out your cash and part with your time and some of your effort and energy, and I appreciate that. So hopefully you'll find some inspiration here today. All right, to get the most out of today, a couple more notes. Number one, be thankful. That's a good way to capture the most of a day like this. Be thankful for what you already have. That shouldn't be any problem in America, being thankful. 
everything we need is available in America. Everybody wants to come here, right? The last time I was here, that little presentation I gave, everybody wants to come here, America. People haven't plotted and schemed the last 40 years, saying if I could just get to Poland, everything would be okay. <laughs> no, everybody wants to come to America. Why? Everything's available here. All the books you need, all the sermons you need, all the churches you need, all the schools you need, all the instruction you need, all the inspiration you need, all the capital you need, all the markets you need, all the challenge you need, all the information you need, all the seminars you need. Everything's available here. This is America. So number one, let's be thankful for what we already have. Thanksgiving does this, opens up the doors, opens up the windows, opens up the channels. Thanksgiving for what you already have. I did a seminar one weekend up at the ranch, up at Clear Lake. Got a lodge up there, nice setting, high valley, high serenity ranch. For the weekend, Friday evening, Saturday, Sunday, people drove in from around California. I got there late Friday afternoon. Everybody had pretty well already gotten there. I couldn't believe the parking lot. Continentals and Eldorados and Mercedes and Cadillacs and unbelievable. Ferrari, one Rolls Royce, unbelievable. I walked in, good looking crowd about like this, sitting there ready for the weekend seminar. My opening remarks were, ladies and gentlemen, I think the rest of the world would find it strange that we have all come here this weekend to try to figure out how to do better. Right? I think the rest of the world would say, I don't understand. The guy in his Rolls Royce saying, I got to get to the seminar, find out how to get another one of these Rolls Royces. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, let's be thankful. Here's what locks up the doors and the channels to receive more cynicism. That locks you away. That prevents you from learning more, being a cynic about the past and the future. A cynic about the marketplace, cynical about the people, cynical about the institutions, cynical about the setup, cynical about yourself, cynical about your chances. See, that locks away all the chance for stuff to flow your way. So, good advice, I think, today. Start off, be thankful. Here's number two, listen well. And that's going to be a challenge today. I understand that. seems like most of, you know, our life is still going on outside these four walls, right? Most of our life seems like it's all, you know, continuing out there. Family and business and associates and market and economy and whatever else is happening in the midst of your life. And to sort of, you know, pull your attention from what's going on out there and put it in here for just a few hours, I know is a challenge. But do the best you can, listen well. And here's the last one, take good notes. Be a good student today. Take some good notes. I've not come to entertain you. As you can tell by my opening joke, right? I would not make it in Las Vegas. So we don't have a dog and pony show today. No entertainment. But I do have some ideas. Take some good notes. Somebody showed me the other day notes that they took about 21 years ago attending one of my seminars out in Los Angeles. He said, I still use these notes I took 21 years ago to help me in my business, relationship with my family. So I'd like to have these notes that you take today become that valuable for you. Then it would be worth me making the investment to come and spend a portion of my life, my time, my energy here. And I want this investment I'm making here today to pay off. And one of the ways it can pay off for me is for you to take good notes and then go away and use whatever makes sense. Because what I feast on coming back around is the stories out of this audience today, sure enough. Six weeks from now, six months from now, six years from now. Somebody's going to, by phone, by letter, by personal contact, walk up to me and say, the things you shared that day got me thinking. And I started making some changes. And let me tell you what's happened to my business. Let me tell you what's happened to my sales career. Let me tell you what's happened to my relationship with my family. See, that'll make it worth it for me. Not the money, the return. Something you can't buy with money. If somebody says, thank you for touching my life and taking the time to make the investment. And that's what I'm all about. So if you'll become a good student today. And here's the last note. Don't be a follower, be a student. You'll be happy to know today we haven't come seeking disciples. We've got no movement for you to join. I'm just here to share some of my experiences, good ideas, best I can. But I think that's good advice. Don't be a follower, be a student, right? Take advice, but not orders. 
Take information, but don't let somebody, you know, order your life. Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion. Excellent note to make. Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion. Not to do what someone else says. Take what someone else says. Process it. Think about it. Ponder it. If it makes you wonder, if it makes you think, then it's valuable. Then when you go take action, make sure that the action is not what somebody told you to do. Make sure the action is the product of your own conclusion. If you'll follow just a little bit of those simple guidelines, I'm telling you the learning process can be speedy, swift, powerful. Your learning curve can go up and then applying it to your business, your life, your family, conversations, equities of all kinds. You'll find some progress like I did that first five years when I met a teacher willing to share with me Turned my life around. Progress I couldn't believe happened for me. Okay. Let's get started. I want to review. I was here last time, and we talked about the five major pieces to the life puzzle. And I just want to review those because it lays such a good foundation for all the rest that I want to share with you today. We've got a lot of subjects to cover, so we're going to go rather swiftly, okay? Put on your mental track shoes here and run with me today because I'm going to deal mostly in concepts. Expect you to, you know, fill in a lot of the details because I've got a lot to share. I want to get through it all. But let's lay this foundation again of the five major pieces. Happens to be the title of my latest book. But I think it is so valuable in laying a foundation. It's some of the things I learned between ages 25 and 30. The teacher who taught me taught me so well. He dealt in these fundamentals, we call these fundamentals. We call these basics. Basics for sports, fundamentals for sports, fundamentals for your business, fundamentals for the way you deal with your family, a few simple things, a few basic things that if you practice every day can make all the difference in the world, how it works out. I boiled it down to five major pieces to the life puzzle. Let's just review those. Number one is philosophy. Philosophy, as I taught the last time I was here, philosophy, in my personal opinion, is the major determining factor in how your life works out. Philosophy, the major determining factor in how your life works out. Philosophy, to form our philosophy, you've got to think, you've got to use your mind, you've got to process ideas. And this whole process over a lifetime, starting way back here when we were children, schools that we've attended, our parents, our experiences, all this stuff that we've processed by the thinking process helps to develop our philosophy. And in my opinion, each person's personal philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. Here's what I called it in that last presentation when I was here. It's called the set of the sail. Each person's personal philosophy is like the set of the sail. Now, I used to think it was circumstances that ordered my life, if someone would have asked me at age 25, Mr. Owen, how come you're not doing well? Pennies in your pocket, creditors calling, nothing in the bank, behind on your promises to your family, you live in America, 25 years old, got a beautiful family, every reason to do well, and things are not going that well for you. What is wrong here? It would not have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. I mean, it would not have occurred to me saying, well, I got this lousy philosophy and that's how come I got pennies in my pocket and nothing in the bank and things aren't working well. That would not have occurred to me. I found it much easier to blame the government, much easier to blame the tax problem. I used to say taxes are too high. Top tax rate when I first started paying taxes, 91%. Back then, when your income reached a certain level, all your income over that, 91%. So I used to say that's too Hi, now the tax, top tax rate's about 33%, but people are still saying what? Taxes are two. See, but you can't use that anymore. If it's gone from 91 to 33, how could it be too high? Come on. I threw all that old excuse stuff away. Some people found it, though, and they're <laughs> using it these days. My old list. I used to blame the traffic, the weather, I used to blame circumstances. Right? People say, I'm too, too tall, I'm too short, I'm too old, I was raised in obscurity, raised on a farm, parents of modest means, all the stuff. 
If you were to ask me, how come you find yourself here, Mr. Rohn, age 25, living in America, land of abundance and opportunity, pennies, zero in the bank, not doing well, creditors calling, it would not have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. I found it easier to blame the company, company policy. I used to say, if this is all they pay, how do they expect you to do well? So I figured that, you know, my future was going to be tied to what everybody else was arranging, the economy and... Right? Interest rates, I used to say things cost too much. That was my whole explanation, not my philosophy, until my teacher taught me better that this is where the problem was, my own personal philosophy. Here's what's exciting about each person's personal philosophy. That's what makes us different than dogs and animals and birds and cats and spiders and alligators. That's what makes us different than all other life forms. The ability to think, the ability to use your mind, the ability to process ideas and not just operate by instinct. In the winter, I'm telling you, the goose can only fly south. What if south doesn't look too good? Tough luck. It can only fly south. But see, human beings are not like a goose, can only fly south. I mean, you can turn around, go north, you can go east, you can go west, you can order the entire process of your own life. And we do that by the way we think. We do that by exercising our mind. We do that by processing ideas and come up with a better philosophy, a better strategy for our life, goals for the future, okay? Plans to achieve those goals. All this comes from developing our philosophy. Philosophy helps us to process what's available. Well, when we get here, we got seed, and we got soil, and we got some rain, and we've got some what? Sunshine, and we've got some seasons, and what? The miracle of life. Now, the key is, what do you do with all this stuff? How do you turn all this stuff that's available here into equity, and promise, and lifestyle, and dreams, and future possibilities. All of this that's possible now with human beings, how do you take all this stuff and turn it into this equities and values? Well, it starts with philosophy. What is the seed? What is the soil? What is the sunshine? What is the rain? Is it possible to take some of each of all the stuff that's available and turn it into food and turn it into value and turn it into nourishment? turn it into something spectacular and unique that no other life form can do? And the answer is yes. But you cannot deal with all this stuff and what to do with it unless you start refining your philosophy. Think, use your mind, come up with ideas and strengthen your philosophy. So the seed and the soil and the rain and the sunshine, this is called, you know, the economy and the banks and the money and the schools and uh, everything that's available out there, processing, information, what to do with all that, and turn it into equity and value. That is the major challenge of life, my personal opinion. So each person's personal philosophy now is going to determine what you're going to do with seed and soil and sunshine and rain and miracle, the change of seasons. That's it, my personal opinion. Each person's personal philosophy is like the set of the sail. That's what this seminar is for today. Help you to trim a better sail. You don't need a better economy. You don't need better seed and soil. In fact, when it comes to seed and soil and rain and sunshine and seasons and the miracle of life, that's all you got. Now, what if you blame this stuff? Then you're blaming all you got. If you blame the economy and you blame the schools and you blame the teachers and you blame the sermons and the preachers and, and you blame, uh, you know, the marketplace and you blame the company and company policy, what else is there? When some people get through with their blame list, there isn't nothing else. That's all there is. And if you blame the only thing you've got to work with, I'm telling you, it's called mistake colossal. In not understanding that that's all you've got to work with. And if this is all you've got to work with, then you don't change the seed and you don't change the soil and you don't change the rain and you don't change the sun sign, you don't change the seasons. Right? Guy says, I'll take three springs, four summers, nine falls, no winters. And no, you can't fool with this stuff. You've got to take it like it comes. Then what do you change to make your life work well? You've got to start with your philosophy. 
Guess what I had to do at age 25 in order to change my own future? I had to change my mind. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. I was messed up on what was causing my problem. And once I got that straightened out, that all the stuff I blamed, the government and taxes and the marketplace and the economy and things cost too much, negative relatives, cynical neighbors, once I got rid of that and started going for where the real problem was, which was me, I'm telling you, my life exploded into change. My bank account changed immediately. My income changed immediately. My whole life took on a whole new look and color immediately. And the early results I got from making these philosophical changes tasted so good, I've never stopped the process from that day until this. And I'm telling you, with a little consideration of the refinement of your sail, by setting a better sail, refining your philosophy, your whole life can start to change from today on. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait till next month. You don't have to wait till spring. You don't have to wait till 93. You can start this whole process immediately. I recommend it. Now, some people do so little thinking, they don't even have their sail up. I mean, you can imagine where they're going to wind up at the end of this week, at the end of this month, at the end of this year. <laughs> Now's the chance to change, process all this information. So number one is philosophy. Okay. And we dealt with all that, where we get ideas from personal experience, from other people's experiences. I don't want to get into all those details because we covered that the last time I was here. But philosophy, that's number one, my personal opinion. Each person's personal philosophy. Here's the definition of success and failure. Just make this note. Here's failure. A few errors in judgment. Repeated every day. Now, you can automatically assume, Mr. Owen, I say, I can understand that. A few errors in judgment repeated every day. For six years? I'm with my father. I think I told this story the last time I was here. My father, 88 years old, he's never been ill, still hasn't retired. Not long ago, midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. We've drilled a new well, got some extra water, got some more acres going. He's all excited. At midnight, we're getting ready to go to bed. My father's eating what he calls his midnight snack. A little bite to eat before you go to bed. Don't have to go to bed hungry. And I'm watching him eat this midnight snack. Guess what he had? An apple, a few graham crackers, and a glass of grapefruit juice. I said, no wonder my father's so healthy. My mom taught us all those good health practices. Taught me when I'm growing up, right? I'm an only child, I've never been ill. Passed the big 5-0 some time ago. My two daughters, 32, 33, never been ill. My grandkids, never been ill. I'm telling you, the legacy lingers on. As I watched my father have this midnight snack, suddenly occurred to me. I know that's part of it. An apple, what? A day, that's gotten to Dallas-Fort Worth, right? An apple. <laughs> An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Good question for this intelligent audience. What if that's true? You say, well, Mr. Owen, if that's true, that would be easy to do. Then what's the problem? It's easy not to do. It's easy not to adopt it as your own personal philosophy. Or the guy messed up the saying. Guy says, a Hershey bar a day, say, no, no, you've been watching too much television. It is not Hershey bar. You've got to be smarter in philosophy than to fall for the Hershey bar a day when it's an apple a day. You've got to be smarter than that. And if you make that kind of an error in judgment every day for six years, I'm telling you, it'll accumulate into disaster. Sometimes the first year you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now, what difference is it gonna make? You gotta be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You gotta be so smart that you look down the road and say, will the errors in my present judgment of philosophy, what's that gonna cost me in one year, six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic if you look down the road a little ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment like an apple versus a Hershey bar? Is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. I started working when I was 19. 
I met my teacher who helped turn my life around when I was 25. That's six years. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promises. I live in America. I'm 25-year-old American male. I got a nice family, every reason to do well. And I'm messed up. Now, what's messed up? I used to think it was the community that was messed up, and the country was messed up, and the government was messed up. If those Democrats ever get in the White House, that'll really mess things up. If the Republicans stay in power, that'll really mess things up. The economy was messed up. Interest rates are messed up. I thought all this stuff was messed up. Then I found out that's not what was messed up. I was criticizing the only thing I had to work with. What was really messed up was my own personal philosophy. My own errors in judgment in my own personal philosophy brought me in six years to pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well living in America, 25-year-old American male, got a family, every reason to do well. Now, once I understood this, here's the formula for failure, errors in judgment, being lax about developing your own personal philosophy. I'm telling you, it's called accumulated disaster. It doesn't matter whether it's your health or your bank account. Guy's got an empty bank account, probably has high cholesterol. Why? Over the last six years, he never paid attention to either one. And it doesn't matter whether it's a dollar or whether it's your money or whether it's your cholesterol count. All you got to do is commit the errors and just because disaster doesn't fall on you at the end of the first day that you don't eat an apple. You say, well, I didn't eat an apple today and tonight I'm not ill. Well, you got to be brighter than that. Someday you got to leave first grade. The reason we make those first grade desks so small so they won't fit at age 25. I mean, right? <laughs> you don't belong here anymore. Come on. Now let me give you the secret to success. The formula for failure, a few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month, starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happens in six years. Now here's the formula for success. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And you've started a whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And if you decide today to go for the apple instead of the Hershey bar, I'm telling you, you have begun the process of turning your life around. And if you keep up that process, not only with your health habits, but with your money habits and with your communication habits, with your sales habits and management habits and every other habit that you've got, if you'll start that process, eliminate the errors and replace it with disciplines practiced, I'm telling you, you can start this process of life change immediately. After today, you don't ever have to be the same again. Only by choice. You don't have to walk out of here the same as you walked in today. Only by choice. You can start a whole new process. And you say, well, Mr. Owen, is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. Where else would you start but with an apple? You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health and you don't? What will that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could and you should and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't. I mean, don't might mean you're careless. Won't probably means you're stubborn. And either one's called disaster. Could, should, don't. I'm telling you, that's why at the end of five years, I've, six years, I found myself with pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, creditors calling. Could, should, won't. Could, should, don't is called disaster. Now, how do you change all that? The next six years, I got rich. The next six years, I became a millionaire. By the time I'm 31, I'm a millionaire. How about that? You say, well, Mr. Rohn, what happened? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the government was about the same. <laughs> I'm telling you, taxes were about the same. My negative relatives were the same. I'm telling you, the economy was about the same, and prices were about the same, and Everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. 
Somebody says, well, what did you go to work on to do all that? I started with my philosophy. I started amending my errors by doing some better thinking, changing my mind, coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life. Within a six-year period, I was never the same. And I've kept up that process all these years. One of the reasons why I'm here is to continue my craft. I don't want the day to come someday. Somebody says, you should have heard Jim Rohn 10 years ago when he was really terrific. <laughs> Guess what I want people to say? I heard him 10 years ago, but you should hear him now. I'm telling you the man works on his craft. I'm telling you the man's done some extra reading. I'm telling you the man doesn't miss a trick. I'm telling you he's worked hard on himself. That's why he's able to deliver like he does. The same thing can happen for you as a teenager. It can happen to you as a mother, as a father. As a business person, as a salesperson, running a business, doesn't matter. Management, wherever you find yourself, this is the process called personal change. And what I say to start with is start with your own philosophy. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines or continue the errors that's called potential disaster. And everybody has it within their power. Well, it was so happy for me to find out at age 25, Mr. Shove said, Mr. Rohn, you don't have to change countries. But you do have to change philosophy. And if you'll change philosophy, not country, you can turn around your income, you can turn around your bank account, you can turn around your skills, you can become capable, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the other equities that you could possibly want out of your life using the only stuff there is and not trying to change any of this stuff. Appreciate all of this stuff with all of its ups and downs, with all of its mystery of why it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Don't challenge this. You don't have to ask for another planet. You don't have to ask for another country. Just ask for another book. Ask for another seminar. Ask for another idea. And you can start this whole process of personal life change. Now, I could spend the whole day on philosophy, because that's where it is. If I could get you intrigued with that enough to study it, enough to ponder it, to where you'd pick up the commitment like I did and say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block, why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you going to start? Might as well start where it's easy, and then go to the more complicated disciplines. Because if you can't handle the complicated, the simple disciplines, how can you handle the complicated ones? Philosophy. Here's number two. I got to give these now very quickly because I got too much to cover here to linger too long. Number one, we're affected by philosophy. First major of the five major pieces. Number two is attitude. We're affected by how we feel. First, we're affected by what we know and the decisions we, and the decisions we make. Second, we're affected by attitude, how we feel. And I gave that quick list. Let me give it to you. It's how you feel about the past. You've got to have a good attitude about the past. Use it as a school, not a club. Don't beat yourself to death with your past. Falls, failures, losses. Let the past be a school. Harsh school, maybe. What else is new? Let the past be a school master to teach you. Not to threaten you, but to teach you. Okay. Next, it's how you feel about the future. Set your goals. We'll talk a little bit about that before we finish today. Goal setting. The promise of the future is an awesome force to affect your life every day. Without a future well designed, we take hesitant steps. And all you have to have is hesitant steps. For six years, you'll be timid, driven into a corner, not boldly willing to go and take your portion, take your share. Okay? Next, it's how you feel about everybody else. Got to have a good attitude about everybody else because it takes everybody else to make a market. One person doesn't make a family. One person doesn't make a business. One person doesn't make a corporation. One person doesn't make a community. One person doesn't make a nation. It takes all of us to make a dynamic economy, a nation second to none. It takes all of us to make the churches and make the economy run. It takes all of us to make the possibilities. All the gifts that have flowed in here the last 200 years, unprecedented in six and a half thousand years of recorded history. There's been nothing like it. The ethnic streams that have flowed in here brought their gifts, brought their talent, brought their skills, brought their inventions, brought their work ethic. All of it mixed together is called America. Been nothing like it in six and a half thousand years. 
and to miss the value of it by some, you know, warped attitude about it, I'm telling you, you've missed it all. And if you have an appreciation for it all, you'll draw from it. And if you draw from all the gifts that have been blended together here for 200 years now for your value and benefit, think of what you can do for your days, for your business, for your conversation, for your equities. You can transform it to an incredible degree. And here's the last one. It's how you feel about yourself. Understanding self-worth is the beginning of progress. Self-worth should be easy. If one of us can do it, all of us can do it. If anybody can think it, we all can think it. I can read, you can read. I can understand, you can understand. From where I came from, the few simple things I did and tried revolutionized my life in five years. There isn't anybody here that can't do it. Change from pennies to fortune. Change from nothing to something. Change from broke to rich. Anybody in this room can do it. If any of us can do it, we all can do it. That's the kind of value you should place on yourself. If Jim Rohn can understand it, I can understand it. If he can read, I can read. If he can find it, I can find it. If he can change, I can change. If he can get it done, I can get it done. That's the attitude about yourself. So valuable. Okay? Now, in transforming our lives, we don't start with attitude. We don't start with the inspiration here. We start with education. Somebody says, well, I expected you to just come get motivated today. Well, that probably won't do it. Somebody says, by now we should be standing on the chairs, waving a flag, singing the old gray mare, get going here. No, that's not where you start. Life change does not start with inspiration. Life change starts with education. You've got to be educated to the point of where you might have messed up. My teacher put it in blunt, simple language. He only went to the ninth grade in school, so he put it in simple language I could understand. He said, Mr. Owen, after six years living in America, healthy American male, 25 years old, been working six years, one year of college, pennies in your pocket, nothing in the bank, behind on your promises, Shove said, I just got one simple explanation for that. You've messed up. <laughs> now, I could understand that kind of language. <laughs> Substitute a Hershey bar for an apple means you've messed up. Should walk around the block, could walk around the block, won't walk around the block. You have messed up. And all you got to go is right down through the list. Don't need some teacher to come by and tell you. Be your own best teacher saying, hey, let me make a list of some places I've messed up. Because if I let this down, let this down, that probably affects the rest. And the answer is, that's true. So we don't start with inspiration. We start with education. Somebody says, well, just motivate this guy. He'll be all right. Just motivate him. Get him turned on. Probably not. If a guy's an idiot, you motivate him. Now you've got a motivated idiot. <laughs> no, he won't be all right. So we start with education. What's the first education? If it isn't going well and you live in America, you have messed up. You don't need to change countries. You say, well, a country's messed up. That's like cursing the soil and cursing the seed and the sunshine and the rain, which is all you got. Don't curse all you got. When you get your own planet, you can rearrange this whole deal. But <laughs> this one, you got to take like it comes. So number two was attitude. Here was number three. Activity. This is the work part, the labor part. Taking action. And the activity is the miracle working piece. A miracle being something we don't quite understand how it works doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means we just don't quite understand how it works. Miracles work. God says. Now, I'm an amateur on God, but here's my best analysis. God says. If you'll plant the seed, I'll make the tree. Now, that's a good arrangement. Number one, gives God the tough end of the deal. What if you had to make the tree? That'd keep you up late night trying to figure out, <laughs> how do you make a tree? I say, no, I'm telling you, the mystery and the miracle of this stuff has already been set up. God says, I got the miracle going, I got the seasons going, I got some sunshine and some rain, and I'm God. But the way I've arranged that, I just need somebody to plant the seed, not chant. In California, they're trying to chant to get this stuff done. <laughs> Forget this California stuff. You don't have to rub a crystal and sleep under a pyramid. This stuff's too easy. Getting rich is too easy. Changing your life is too easy. Forget all that. Right? Massive bombard, affirmation, forget all that. My opinion. 
Ocean waves and seagulls? Come on, this stuff's too simple. Just simple, easy stuff. But if you neglect it, that's how it piles up year after year, but if you're willing to straighten it out. And here's one of the keys. It's called activity. It's called disciplines. Turning wisdom from your philosophy and inspiration, the strengthening of attitude and faith and courage, commitment and all this stuff that comes from attitude. If you're willing to take these two qualities, philosophy and attitude, and invest it into activity, you can have a miracle. Anything short of that, no miracle. Wisdom doesn't perform a miracle. Attitude doesn't perform a miracle. The only thing that performs a miracle of increase called equity is called putting wisdom and attitude into discipline, into labor. And this labor now can perform a miracle. And here's the two parts to the labor. One, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Can't give you better advice than that. Number one, do what you can. You just got to go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do? That could greatly change my health, my wealth? What am I not doing I'm neglecting that would be easy to do? Just go home and answer that question personally. You don't have to put the answers on a public bulletin board. This is just all personal stuff. From the walk around the block to the apple to what to do with your money, which we're going to cover today. What does a child do with a dollar? We're going to cover that today. Errors in judgment, disaster. A few simple disciplines, wealth beyond imagination. And if you'll pick up the activity part, the miracle working part, plant the seed part, take care of your part. The soil will take care of its part, and the seed will take care of its part. The seasons will take care of their part. The miracle will take care of its part. If you'll take care of your put part, call putting it into activity, action. Works miracles. 2,000 years ago, on April 13th, one of Jesus' disciples. Now, again, I'm an amateur on the Bible, but best as I can remember it, one of Jesus' disciples said to Jesus, it's time to pay our taxes, and we don't have any money. That's how come I know it was about April 13th. <laughs> to this statement by his disciple, Jesus said, best as I can read the record, Jesus said, no problem. Now, why could he say no problem? Well, word has it, word has it, he was a miracle worker. Word has it, if you're a good student of history, Word has it, he was a miracle worker. If you handed a problem to a miracle worker, what would he be inclined to say? No problem. You got to hang out with folks like that. <laughs> I belong to a small group like that. We do business around the world. You hand these guys a problem, they say, no problem, what? How many books would they read to solve it? Many as it takes. How early would they get up? Early as it takes. How much information would they gather? Much as they needed. So it's what? No problem. You got to hang out with folks like that. Jesus said, this will be no problem, the tax thing. He said to his disciples, it's simple, go fishing. Wow. <laughs> now that was easy for this particular disciple. His name was Peter. And Peter was a fisherman. How clever. How clever. But here's the real problem. If you should fish, and you could fish, and you don't fish, you got no miracle. You could change, you should change, you won't change. That's called accumulated disaster. In six years, you'll be explaining instead of celebrating. Having some ragged list like I had, reasons for not doing well pennies in my pocket. Could, should, don't, disaster. And if you'll just start the process of change, could, should, and will, you can start this whole process. And if you will, then put it into action. The miracle belongs to you. Jesus said to his disciple, it'll be simple. Go fishing, and the first fish you catch, look in his mouth. Peter said, okay. He was used to strange things happening in this relationship. 
Peter goes fishing, catches the first fish, looks in his mouth. Guess what's in the fish's mouth? Coins. Peter says, wow, coins. <laughs> Starts counting the value of these coins. And when he adds it up, guess how much it added up to? Exactly enough money to pay his taxes and Jesus' taxes. Which gives you Jesus' position on taxes. Now, we call that what? A miracle, only because we don't quite understand how it works. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It simply means we don't quite understand how it works. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done, postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. That'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing the man says well my mother lives down in florida should have written her six months ago i just can't seem to get that letter written i'm asking you to get that letter written clean that up and don't walk like other people walk don't postpone like other people postpone you say well is it as simple as writing a letter and the answer is yes where else would you start for life change personal change you don't need a pink package to fall out of the sky you don't need massive bombard pre-conscious subconscious. Practice channeling, find a 2,000 year old guru. I mean, you don't need any of that stuff. Pass on all that. Kids are afraid of that stuff. Too much of it, you'll be out on a limb with Shirley. I mean, don't pass on all that stuff. This stuff's too easy, this stuff's too simple. It's called take action, number one, on neglect. On errors, in discipline, number two, start setting up some disciplines. And if you'll do that, you'll perform a miracle. Now, here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, I would ask you to amend it. Let me give you the best of ancient script. Here's what it says. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, do it with all your strength, and do it with all your power. What a good philosophy. That kind of philosophy revolutionize your life if you haven't picked it up lately. Guy slips in late, company doesn't seem to mind, slips out early, first one in the parking lot, heading for happy hour. Stretches his break, comes early for lunch, late back from lunch, company doesn't seem to notice. Guy says, best as I can calculate, I'm putting in about a half a day's work and I'm collecting a full day's pay. And the guy says, I got it made. Little does he know the seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor and about activity and about miracle and soil and seed and sunshine and rain and the economy and the banks and the money and the companies and the schools and what's going on. It's your philosophy and your attitude and then your ability to take action. All of that we call the process of life change, miracle working. Number one, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Here was number four. Results. Results. Every once in a while, you gotta take a measure, see how you're doing with these three pieces, philosophy, attitude, activity. Now we take a measure called results. What is the results at the end of the day, the results at the end of the week? You can't let too much time go by without checking. When time goes by, six years I'd been out there working when I met my teacher, Mr. Shilp. Shilp said, well, Mr. Rohn, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, in the last six years, how much money have you saved and invested? Let's go through a little tab list here. How much money have you saved and invested the last six years? I said, what? Zero. He said, you have messed up. You remember these notes. I like that. You've messed up. He said, who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. What if you were 50 and broke? Right? Didn't need to change countries. Bought the wrong plan. What a sad scenario that would be. Shove said these questions. Let's go through some results. He said, how many books have you read in the last 90 days? 
I said, what? Zero. Wisdom of the world available? Change your life, change your future. Wisdom of the world available? Develop, develop any skill you want, earn the kind of income you want, have all the treasures you want, equities you want, relationship with your family that you want, everything that you want available, and the wisdom of the world to help you get it. Haven't read any books in the last 90 days. My teacher said, Mr. Rohn, you have messed up. I'm telling you, you've got the deal. Shelf said, Mr. Rohn, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills? Go for the American dream. Become rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many classes have you taken in the last six months? I said, how many? Zero. He said, you have messed up. He said, you don't need to unmess the country. You don't need to straighten out the perplexed. You don't need to straighten out any of this stuff. All you've got to do is look within and let results teach you a great deal about your own activity, your own attitude, and your own philosophy. I went through that process. Take this phrase home. Results is the name of the game. What other game is there? Results. Here's all life asks us to do. Make measurable progress in reasonable time. Just take home that little phrase. Good phrase. We're asked in life simply to make measurable progress in reasonable time. We demanded of our children, how many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? <laughs> Approximately. <laughs> About one. If it looks like they're not going to make it, we pour on the pressure. Call legitimate pressure, lack of results. Peer pressure, family pressure, school pressure, community pressure. Every other kind of pressure we can bring to bear. Why? You can't stay more than one year in fourth grade. As parents, you'd have to leave the community. You say, well, what if they're nice kids? Wouldn't you give them three or four years? And the answer is no. You've got to make better progress than that. So you've got to check fairly often. Some things you've got to check every day. Some things you've got to check at least by the end of the week. Salesman joins his little sales company. He's supposed to make 10 calls first week. Wouldn't it be legitimate to call him in on Friday and say, John, what? How many calls? I mean, this stuff is simple. John says, well, say, John, well won't fit in this little box here. Well. <laughs> now John starts with a story. You say, John, I made this little box so small so a story won't fit. <laughs> I don't need a story. I need what? A number. A number. What will a number tell me? Everything. John's supposed to make 10 calls. What if he made 20? You say, wow, wow, we got somebody. What if he only made one call? Whoa. Will that tell us something about John's philosophy? And the answer is yes. Will it tell us something about his attitude? Of course. Will it tell us something about his disciplines? Of course. And if he wants a lesson in life change, all he has to do is be willing to face the numbers and come up with the results that will teach you to either celebrate if you got good results or fix whatever needs to be fixed in your philosophy, attitude, activity called discipline. You don't need to go anywhere else. I do believe in affirmations, and they are valuable as long as you affirm the truth. Because it says in ancient scripts, the truth, what? Will set you free. Free to do what? Amend your errors and pick up new disciplines. That's what the truth is for, to help us amend our errors and pick up the disciplines for life change. That's what the truth is for. So I do believe in affirming the truth. If you're broke, the best thing to affirm is, I am broke. You put that up on the refrigerator where you can see it every day. I mean, that's how you do that. Now, if you need a little additional affirmation, you just put up there, I'm 40 and broke. I mean, you know, that ought to do it. And if you need just a little more, put up there, I live in America and I'm 40 and broke. That's enough to turn your life around. It says, hey, something is wrong. Somewhere I have messed up. Now, I'm telling you, if you'll start with that, it's called the process of life change, and it doesn't matter how small the process is to start. 
one discipline starts it and then one discipline feeds another feeds another and the first thing you know you've got this whole cycle in an upward positive motion and it's called life change it's called income change it's called health change relationship with your family change equities unprecedented that you can have in numbers that will stagger the imagination if you do not curse what's available and start amending what's possible to get the results that you want. I don't think I can put it in any better language. That's it. Kids can do it. Teenagers can do it. Parents can do it. Managers can do it. Right? Government officials can do it. Anybody can do it. Anybody can do this stuff. It's called personal change. Results is the name of the game. Success is a numbers game. Good note to make. Success is a numbers game. You got to go for the numbers. You got to understand what the numbers are. How many pounds overweight should you be at age 50? <laughs> Approximately. John says, I got big bones. We'll give you 10 pounds. <laughs> 10 pounds for big bones. Otherwise, come on, John. 20 pounds, 25 pounds, shouldn't we turn on the caution light at work and at home? Blinking caution light. Somebody says, what's that caution light? So John's up about 20, 25 pounds. We got the blinking light going at home, got it going here at work. To remind him what? Wrong numbers. Okay. 35, 40 pounds, red light. Blinking at home. Somebody says, what's that blinking red light? Say, John's up about 40 pounds. Fifty pounds, we got the siren. Ah, 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 ah. What's that siren at home and at work? John's up about fifty pounds. <laughs> Cholesterol, almost out of control. Come on. Success is a numbers game. I'm asking you to be mature enough to start checking your own numbers. How many books have you read in the last 90 days? Transform your life. Become cultured, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential all the rest of the stuff you want. How many books? How many classes? How committed are you to taking what's available and turning it into equities unprecedented since we live in a country that there's been no such country in the last six and a half thousand years? If you'll pick up that process, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, it's called life change of the best order. Now, here's the last one. Number five is called lifestyle. Lifestyle is simply learning how to live well. The last of the five major pieces. Here's the ultimate challenge of life. I've worked on this, you cannot believe how hard, since age 25. And that is, after applying better philosophy, attitude, and, and activity, and picking now up results, what are results for? Here's my ultimate challenge on results to fashion, good word to jot down, fashion. Fashion for yourself lifestyle, or what we call the good life. That's the ultimate challenge, to take your results, take your money, take your results, take the return, take the equities you've gathered, and now fashion for yourself a good life, like weaving a tapestry. And Mr. Schoff gave me all kinds of examples on lifestyle. He gave me two phrases that helped change my life. In case you have to leave early, let me give you these two phrases. It'll be worth the price of coming and being here today. Just take these two phrases home in case you have to leave early. Here's number one. Schoff said, Mr. Owen, if you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. When he said that, I said... My gosh, I don't know anybody that studies wealth. Where am I going to learn it? He said, never mind, Mr. Owen, now that you've met me, if you'll be with me for a while, he said, and if you'll commit yourself, he said, I will teach you. And he taught me. He taught me the books. He taught me the stuff. Changed my life. By the time I was 31, I was a millionaire. The man taught me wealth. If you wish to be wealthy, study wealth. 
If you were to show me your present economic plan, in a personal conversation between you and me, you say, Mr. Owen, let me disclose for you my current economic financial plan for the future. Would I get so excited, I'd say, hey, I'm going to go across the country and lecture on your plan. And if the answer is no, Mr. Owen, you probably wouldn't want to go across the country and lecture on my plan. Here's my question to you. Why not? Why wouldn't you have a superior, powerful financial plan that's taking you to the places you want to go? I'm asking you if you find yourself caught like I was at age 25, make the personal commitment today and say, I'm going to study and I'm going to change. And five years from now, nobody's going to be able to say, how come you don't have a superior plan living in a superior country with superior opportunity? Nobody's going to be able to say that five years from now of me. If you'll make that commitment, I'm telling you, this will be one of the most exciting days of your life, not because of my seminar. It'll be one of the most exciting days of your life because of your commitment to this simple little process I've outlined for you. Here was the second phrase. Mr. Shelf said, Mr. Owen, if you wish to be happy, study happiness. I didn't know happiness was a study. My best hope for happiness at age 25 was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed, <laughs> open somehow, something would make me happy. Shelf said, no, Mr. Rohn, happiness is not something you postpone. Happiness is not something off in the future. Happiness is something you design. You've got to get the word. Happiness is something you design. Happiness is a study. Happiness is a practice. Happiness is an art. It's not an accident. It's an art. And anybody that wants to can study, practice the art of happy living. Happiness is like culture. Money doesn't make you cultured. But culture is within the grasp of all of us. How much is a book on sophistication in the marketplace? $4,000? No, $40. I'm telling you, in America, everything's available. Everything's within reach. All you have to be is committed to it and make it a study. Culture is a study. Sophistication is a study. It's not an amount. It's not an account. It's a study. Money doesn't make you sophisticated and cultured. I know a guy that's rich. He's a clod. <laughs> the guy's a clod. Eats with his elbow in his soup. I mean, he's just a clod. Nothing much more pitiful than a rich clod. I mean, you know, it's a sad thing to see. Money doesn't make you sophisticated. Only study and practice makes you sophisticated. Only study and practice makes you cultured. And only study and practice makes you happy. Study and practice makes you rich. Key phrase, don't be lazy in learning. One, how to do well. Next, how to live well. Don't be lazy in learning and practicing the art of economics practicing the art of productivity and practicing the art of lifestyle. Shelf taught me in such simple terms. Shelf said, Mr. Owen, if you're getting your shoes shined, shoe shine boy has done an exceptional job. You look down, you got one of the world's all time great shines and you pay him. And now you got a little change in your hand. Question pops in your mind. Should I give him one quarter or two quarters as a tip from a neat shine? Here's what Shelf said. If two amounts pop in your mind, always go for the higher amount and become the higher thinking person. That helped change my life. Here's what he said, become a two quarter person. Now you can tell that was a long time ago when a quarter was a good tip. Now it takes dollars, but just substitute 1992 dollars for quarters. Shelf said, hey, if you, you know, are thinking one quarter or two quarters, and you say, well, no, I'll just give him one quarter. He said, that'll affect you the rest of the day. The rest of the day, you'll look down, see this great shine, you'll say, I've got to be really cheap. One lousy quarter, tip from a shine. But he said, if you'll go for the two quarters, Shelf said, you can't believe the extra happiness you can buy for just an extra quarter. That's called studying and practicing the art of lifestyle, which means living well. Money doesn't make you happy. Father wads up a $20 bill, throws it at his son, and says, if you need the darn stuff that bad, take it, just get out of my face. How sad, a father with money 
and no joy. He studied economics, but he never studied joy. I'm asking you to turn that around. Turn that all around. I did a seminar one time, St. Louis, Missouri. When I finished a seminar like this, a man walked up and said, Mr. Owen, you've really gotten to me. He said, I'm going to change my philosophy. I'm going to change my attitude. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change everything. He said, you've touched me today. And he said, you'll hear about me. You'll hear my story someday. I said, okay. Right? A lot of people right, say things. Sure enough, a few months later, I come back to St. Louis, did another seminar. When I finished my seminar, I saw this man come walking up. I didn't remember his name, but he said... I'm sure you'll remember me as the man who said, I'm going to go make some changes. You've touched me today. I said, I do remember you. He said, I'm telling you, things are already happening for me. I cannot believe in just a matter of months. He said, one of the things I decided to change was my relationship with my family. He said, my wife and I have two lovely teenage daughters. Parents couldn't ask for any more beautiful, lovely daughters. And he said, uh, I'm the only one that's given him trouble. He said, these daughters of ours have never given us any trouble. He said, I've usually been the one all these years, given all the trouble and all the static. He said, my daughters love to go to the rock concerts, and I'm always giving them trouble. They have to beg me for the money. He said, I don't want you to go. You stay out too late. The music's too loud. You're going to ruin your hearing. You won't be able to hear the rest of your life. And he said, I just get on their case. And he said, they keep begging, keep begging. Finally, when they beg long enough, I say, all right, here's the money. If you have to go that bad, just go. He said, that's how I've been up until now. But he said, after I left your seminar, I decided to change all that called lifestyle, living well. He said, you won't believe it. Not long ago, I picked up the newspaper, and I saw an advertisement, and I knew my two daughters, it was one of their favorite performers, was coming to town. He said, guess what I did? He said, I went down and bought the tickets myself and brought them home, put them in an envelope. And when I saw my daughters later that day, he said, I handed them this envelope and I said to my two lovely daughters, you may not believe it, but inside this envelope are two tickets for the upcoming concert. They could not believe. And he also added, you'll be happy to know Begging days are over. <laughs> now they cannot. He said, now don't open the envelope till you get to the concert. They said, okay. So they go to the concert, come concert time, open up the envelope, hand the tickets to the usher. He says, follow me. And he starts down front. The girls say, hey, hold it, hold it. Something must be wrong. He takes another look, says, no, nothing's wrong. Follow me. Tenth row, center. Now they cannot leave. <laughs> Tenth row, center. The only tickets they were able, able you know, ever to beg for was, right, third balcony, can't see. He said, I stayed up a little late that night. Sure enough, a little after midnight, my two daughters come bursting through the front door. One of them lands in my lap. The other one's got her arms around my neck. They're both saying, you got to be one of the all-time world's great fathers. He said, Mr. Owen, you're right. I can't believe. Same money, different father. He said, I've started making the changes and I decided to start with my teenagers, my girls. He said, what a difference it's making in my life. And I'm telling you, you can do that with your lifestyle. You can do it with your sales career. You can do it with your management career. You can do it with any part of your life. If you're looking for equities unmatched, do not curse the only thing you have. Don't complain about the only thing you have, which is seed and soil, sunshine, rain, miracle, and seasons. But start changing and processing and evaluating things like recovering today, and this process of change will take off for you. You will not believe what can happen in such a